Whenever I think about play, its evolution, its purpose, and its persistence in our societies, I always think back to my childhood, a time of blissful ignorance, where everything felt like a new, exciting experience. But as I'm sure most people would agree, the most enjoyable aspect of childhood was playing, playing with other kids, playing sports, or just playing video games. Play is a universal phenomenon found in everything from insects to humans, and it is the predominant form of learning displayed in the animal kingdom. As a result, the question of why animals play has been in the spotlight for quite some time. Herbert Spencer first brought this question to the public with his first theory on the origin of play in his book, The Principles of Psychology. And he thought that play occurs when an animal builds up excess energy in its brain, which is then channeled into silly play behavior that is meant to imitate the functional behaviors vital for survival. Today, while this theory has fallen out of serious consideration, the overarching idea of play being adaptive still continues to shape the ongoing debate around why animals play. And now, the predominant viewpoint regarding play seems to come from its role in exploratory learning in infant animals. Gobnik et al. in 2015 likened playful exploration to simulated annealing, which is a computational optimization algorithm used to find the best solution in a space. To illustrate this idea and the utility associated with play, Cully in 2015 used six-legged robots to investigate developmental play. In this play, the robots were intentionally limiting certain movements as a form of practice or learning during their developmental phase. And as a result, later on, these more playful robots were better at adapting to real injuries. The survival benefits of simple exploratory play are easy to see and easy to interpret as well. As long as the advantages outweigh the costs, it would make sense for animals to play. However, more complex forms of play, especially social play, might have benefits that are not immediately apparent. Social play, such as the rough and tumble play characteristic of many mammals, could help young animals learn skills useful in adulthood. One of the major features of social play is self-handicapping, where a larger, stronger, more skilled play partner deliberately suppresses his or her ability in a manner that keeps the game going, usually by letting the smaller, weaker player win at least 30% of the time. This has been documented in many species, but the analysis by Ham et al. is one of the few detailed documentations of how this is carried out in aquatic environments, specifically in beluga whale calves. Social play and its vital importance is most easily explainable through an evolutionary lens. But to really grasp the bigger picture of why play is so important, we first have to take a look at the neuroscientific research that is present on play. Stefan Sivi and Jack Panksepp have pinpointed a specific region of the thalamus as the key neuroanatomical component in social play. They found that removing this specific portion of the thalamus in rats results in the cessation of specific play behaviors, like engaging in contact for play, while other complex behaviors, such as foraging, remain unaffected. From this research, it seems like social play is intricately tied to a balance between both danger and safety at the neural level, and involves navigating between familiar and novel responses to environmental experiences in order to learn and therefore adapt. Michael Huffman conducted a study on stone handling, a type of play behavior observed in Japanese macaques over 35 years. Huffman proposed that play and object handling serve a dual function, promoting motor development in the young while simultaneously providing neural regeneration in adult and aging individuals. As I laid out earlier, the evolutionary perspective on social play is focused on its impact in integrating young mammals into social structures. But Porges and Russ suggest that play has much larger effects. Play acts as a form of neural exercise and contributes to processes like balancing the fight or flight system, enhancing measures of adaptive functioning, and even contributes to creativity. If play indeed fosters creativity, a mechanism for adapting to our ancestral environments, then the evolutionary selection of play is quite straightforward. But as the neuroscience research into play has extended, scientists have found even deeper impacts of the functional utility of play. The major advancement in the field of play that made people realize its importance was Jack Panksepp's identification of the play circuit, and specifically by recognizing that rats produce 50 kilohertz ultrasonic vocalizations, which basically means that he discovered that rats laugh. It sounds unimportant on the surface, but laughing is connected to joy. The five characteristics of play are joy, meaning engagement, iteration, and sociality. But for the purpose of this video, we will only focus on three, joy, meaning, and sociality. Joy is characterized by feelings of having pleasantness and fun, which are integral to the play experience and are rarely absent. Some argue that positive emotions like happiness and joy play an evolutionary role by enabling us to interact and respond appropriately to our environment, 
The prevailing theory being that happiness is an emotion meant to guide us in directions that are beneficial for our fitness. So pursuing things like a valued goal, relationship, or skill development. To adapt is to learn, and joy exists to motivate us to continue adapting to our environment. In this regard, joy and play seem to go hand in hand. Researchers have explored the link between joy and learning in both adults and animals for quite some time. And joy is governed by the subcortical limbic networks, which are also present in all mammalian species. In studying this region of the brain, Panksepp discovered that joy is found in other networks involving brain regions responsible for higher order processing and respond adaptively to these emotional experiences, meaning learning and the emotion of joy are connected. Emotions play a crucial role in facilitating rational thought by allowing us to incorporate feedback into our decision making. Given the impact of emotions in priming us for learning, joy stands out as the most potent. At a broad level, the experience of joy is linked to changes in brain networks, such as increases in dopamine levels. Dopamine plays a crucial role in regulating reward, pleasure, and emotion in the brain, as well as influencing our responses to rewards. The effects of dopamine are evident in brain regions identified as part of the reward network, including the midbrain, the hippocampus, and the prefrontal cortex. Dopamine facilitates interactions between these regions and modifies how we respond. Bromberg, Martin, and Eiko Saka connected the presence of dopamine neurotransmitters in the midbrain to the process of anticipating a reward, which, by extension, means they found the part of the brain responsible for seeking information to get a dopamine hit. Activating this system results in a range of cognitive benefits, including enhanced attention, working memory, and improved stress regulation, all of which are advantageous for learning. Although there are various proposed mechanisms for how dopamine precisely acts on brain structures, it is well supported that the presence of dopamine leads to joy, which can lead to improved ability to process and retain information. Therefore, delving into the dopamine reward system can aid in exploring its role in memory, motivation, and creativity, all of which contribute to the learning process. Of course, this is kind of a chicken or egg question, because for play and therefore learning to commence, there must be some initial curiosity first. Many neuroscientists have studied the impact of curiosity on enhanced neural activity. FMRI results reveal that the more we anticipate a positive outcome, a common factor of intrinsic motivation, the more these brain structures enhance our ability to retain information. Even small changes in our environment can spark anticipation for upcoming learning experiences, priming the brain to more effectively retain information. Could this mean that our brain structures evolved curiosity as a way to get us to play? There is evidence suggesting that the chemical responses in the brain caused by joy can impact plasticity, signifying the brain's capacity to continually adapt to new information and environmental inputs. Meaning curiosity would spark play engagement, which would lead to joyful experiences that elevate dopamine levels in the brain and lead to an enhanced ability to adapt. But this is just speculation on my part. Learning though is multifaceted and typically involves transitioning from the unknown to the known. Meaningful experiences can often create a conducive space for these progressions. The neuroscience literature demonstrates that meaningful experiences, think things like stories that can engage multiple different emotions, affect multiple networks in the brain to help us comprehend what we learn. And specifically, it's thought to involve two networks, the fast learning system and the later stage of learning. The first network aids in rapid focused acquisition, scanning for inconsistencies or perceived threats. The second network is then activated to assist us in integrating new information within the context of our pre-existing mental models. Analogical reasoning is a cognitive process that helps us bridge the gap between the known and the unknown, and helps us recognize underlying similarities in objects or concepts. So for example, understanding that honey from a bee is similar to milk from a cow. Research indicates that this type of thinking engages both domain general regions of the brain associated with abstract thinking and domain-specific regions linked to the task at hand. This is important because when learning is perceived as meaningful, knowledge gained in one domain has the potential to transfer to a new domain. Gerardi et al. in 2014, for example, pointed out that as new knowledge becomes more integrated with prior knowledge, the process of encoding and storing this information in memory becomes more efficient and less demanding from a cognitive standpoint. Metacognition is often recognized as crucial in self-regulated learning. The ability to acknowledge and comprehend our own abilities proves valuable in navigating new contexts, reasoning with new information, and building meaningful experiences. Monitoring ourselves in our environments and making judgments in response rely on the capacity to access working memory to predict the future outcomes. 
And when metacognitive skills allow us to derive meaning from our surroundings, which can then be used to make accurate predictions about our performance, our confidence levels increase. And confidence, facilitated by metacognitive skills, can trigger reward-seeking behavior, which we previously laid out as the basis of the play circuit. Finally, let's explore the role of sociality in play. At its core, learning can be viewed as a social enterprise. Most games involve at least two people, require cooperation, and are built on trust. Trust that each person will play the game properly, will abide by the rules, and not take things too far. Our understanding of the world evolves through interactions with others. And Brenner's ecological systems theory demonstrates that an individual's well-being is intricately linked to their social networks, be it just to friends and family members or society at large. Neuroscience research has highlighted the impact of social interactions on brain and behavioral development from birth. Beginning immediately after birth, children's engagements and supportive interactions with adults contribute to the establishment of a robust neural foundation in brain regions responsible for the development of basic systems, such as vision and language. Beyond basic sensory functions, social interaction plays a crucial role in the development of higher cognitive processes. The same functions that contribute to the development of visual and auditory systems also foster cognitive, social, and emotional regulation later on in life. While the social and emotional systems of children primarily depend on interactions with caregivers, interactions with peers become much more influential in later childhood, adolescence, and adulthood. Peer interactions play a crucial role in developing skills, and these interactions provide the context for children to practice self-regulatory skills, including controlling inhibitions and taking appropriate actions. Studies in animal play, mainly in rodents, suggest that social interactions during play support the development of brain regions responsible for learning new skills. In rodents engaged in play fighting, interactions shape the prefrontal cortex and influence self-regulation and planning. So from taking a look at the neuroscience literature, it's clear that play is a self-motivating activity designed for learning. Learning ranging from basic how to get along in group functions to more individualistic skills like higher cognitive functions, such as programming or writing. And since we've accumulated all of this evidence, we can now turn to the evolutionary process to put the finishing pieces on this theory. In one of the most groundbreaking studies of the last 30 years, social interactions during juvenile playful experiences were shown to enhance an animal's adaptability to unexpected circumstances. Specifically, the juvenile experience of play was shown to refine the brain to be more adaptable later on in life, contributing to increased neuroplasticity. On the flip side, young animals deprived of social play exhibited rigidity and abnormally low levels of social behavior in later stages of life, even after re-socialization. Studies involving rats that experience social isolation reveal that they are more susceptible to impulsivity, irregular behaviors, and poor decision-making in unknown situations, meaning play appears to engage mental processes involved in understanding perspectives other than our own, a crucial aspect needed to learn any skill. Environments that provide opportunities to interpret the mental states of others may initiate processes such as theory of mind, which I feel like I talk about in all of my videos. But it is crucial for formal and informal teaching or learning. Whether from caregivers or peers, these findings outline the necessity of play in healthy development. From the earliest stages of evolution, play has been intricately woven into the fabric of our species, serving as a driving force for learning and cognitive advancement. But a theory I have is that one of the biggest problems in our society today is the hijacking of our play circuits. Our dopamine reward system is hijacked through fast-paced social media, on-demand streaming, and just general consumption, among other things. So if you'd like me to make a video on that, let me know. Until next time, cheers.